Green, um, and welcome everyone to this session on uh, light in Gaza. Uh, there are a few announcements I'm supposed to read. So, um, as part of our Socialism 2022 virtual program, this session will be live streamed, including the discussion. If anyone wishes to participate but does not want to be on video, just let our live stream team know, which I assume is those two folks. Um, also, uh, the COVID policy is that every, everyone in the audience has to remain masked and keep the mask over your nose and mouth. Just the speakers uh, are, are able to take off um, their masks. Um, so, I actually wanted to, to start out by reading um, a, a statement by uh, a, a contributor to the book Light in Gaza, which is the focus of this session. She was not able to make it today. Um, her name is Shahid Abu Salama, and she wrote uh, a statement that she wanted us to, to read. Um, so she says, my name is Shahid Abu Salama, a Palestinian refugee, academic, artist, and author. I'm very honored to be addressing the Socialism Conference as a chapter contributor to the recently published Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire, an anthology that not only highlights Gaza's drastic historical and ongoing repression by the Israeli settler colonial and apartheid state, but also celebrates its longstanding resistance and resilience and its centrality to Palestinian identity and liberation. This much needed anthology couldn't have become a reality without the dedication of the American Friends Service Committee, who brought together several strong voices from Gaza to imagine and strive towards an alternative future where the long denied freedom, justice, and equality is afforded to Gaza and the Palestinians everywhere. I have to express how upset I am not to be able to take up the invitation to be there with you in Chicago, but I'm currently paying a heavy price for being vocal a vocal voice against the Zionist colonial oppression of my people in my current exile, the UK, which rendered a speaking tour in the US difficult. My speech will elaborate further on these personal struggles as examples of the collective and repetitive struggles the indigenous people of Palestine face beyond the boundaries of historic Palestine, where the colonial narrative continues to enjoy more legitimacy over that of the colonized. I recently completed my PhD at Sheffield Hallam University, which explored and compared the representations of Palestinian refugees in Gaza in colonial, humanitarian, and Palestinian documentary films until the 1993 Oslo Agreement between the PLO and Israel. My, dis my dissertation, which inspired much of the ideas ar I articulated in my chapter, was motivated by the fact that I am also a third generation refugee, originally from Beit Jirja and Estud, my grandparents' home villages that were completely destroyed and depopulated in the 1948 Zionist ethnic cleansing of Palestine. A crime backed by imperial support that continues to target Palestinian communities today to maintain a state of Jewish supremacy on our land. This is how I ended up born in Palestine's largest refugee camp, Jabalia, which is 74 years old, as old as the Israeli state, and our Nakba that is man, a man-made catastrophe, an ongoing process of elimination that has been taking place conceptually as well as physically, before, during, and after the foundation of the Israeli state. Failing to make this connection between the establishment and the advancement of the Israeli state and the dispossession and ongoing elimination of the Palestinian people contributes to keeping us caught in the political wilderness. Meanwhile, Palestinians continue to be vulnerable to repressive apartheid policies, military occupation, settler violence, as well as Western hostility and repression whenever we dare to expose the long-standing crimes befalling us and the chain of complicity enabling it, especially the US that has been its biggest supporter with billions of dollars annually, uh, mostly in the form of military aid. But the Palestinian struggle has no borders. The brunt of Israel's assault is in my long besieged city of, of birth, Gaza, where alongside two million of mostly internally displaced Palestinians, I survived multiple uh, brutal attacks by Israel of mowing the, laws, the lawns that uh, maimed and killed thousands of innocents and repeatedly destroyed its infrastructure. It is in the Naqab where Bedouin villagers are being evicted and their homes bulldozed it is in Sheikh Jarrah in occupied Jerusalem and Masafir Yattas, uh, southern Hebron, where Israel is dispossessing Palestinian families to make way for Jewish settlers. It is also in the uprooting of our historical olive trees, in the de-Arabization of Palestine, and the theft and eradication of the Palestinian culture and collective memory. 
This is the mode of operation of settler colonialism, the elimination of the indigenous people, a process that has left traumatic traces on the Palestinian people, which can be illustrated in my own family. When my father first experienced two month imprisonment at the age of 14, when Israel occupied the Gaza Strip in 1967, he was again persecuted when he was 19 and endured 13 years of captive resistance in the Israeli prison system before his release in 1985. 13 years is only not that long compared to his original sentence of which was suspended as part of a deal struck to ex uh, exchange Palestinian and Israeli prisoners. As a daughter of Marxist Palestinian former political prisoner raised up in the world's largest open air prison of Gaza, oops, sorry, one second. Um, I learned that imprisonment is inflicted in various magnitudes. I also learned that freedom can be practiced in the worst conditions. I can't recall my father ever showing regret for 15 years of captive resistance in Israeli jails. There is a precious sense of freedom and resistance to colonial oppression that defined his dispossessed parents' lives as well as his and ours. He is a revolutionary, and as a Palestinian refugee, revolutionary thinking has been an organic part of his upbringing that he instilled in us. In November 1972, the prosecutor called on the court to wage a serious war against terror and imposed the harshest push punishment on my father and his comrades, who were all charged with belonging to the Marxist-leaning Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Especially bitter is the fate of anyone suspected of holding communist values, his lawyer Felicia Langer noted, as she recorded his story in her book, With My Own Eyes. According to her, the prosecutor claimed to be showing lenience in not asking for death, a death sentence. Before issuing his verdict of seven life sentences plus 10 years, the judge allowed my then 19-year-old father and his comrades to say their parting words, but warned, I don't want to hear political speeches. His comrade Abdul Rahman, now the husband of my maternal aunt, said there was no point since they did not recognize Israeli jurisdiction. A riot erupted inside the courtroom and the defendants were prohibited from making further comments. In the middle of all this, my father shouted his belief in the triumphant power of the revolution to achieve justice for them in Palestine. In that shout uh, and refusal to submit to the legitimacy of the Israeli courts that form part of the mechanisms of oppressed against, uh, oppression against the Palestinian people, there was also a practice of freedom that questions, free, uh, that questions freedom for a settler colonial state where separation walls, fences, barbed wire, trenches, and heavy militarization and securitization are the norm. My father was released on, uh, in May 1985 following a lo long negotiation that struck a deal for Israel to release uh, 1,150 prisoners in exchange for the three Israelis that Palestinian re resistance had captive. Subsequently, my father's original sentence that had meant his prison would be his grave were suspended at the age of 33, making my family possible. Fast forward to now, I have been confronting another uh, front in the repression of the Palestinian struggle, as has my brother in Germany. I'm not equating my experience with that of my father. He had to put up with much worse than I. My point is to illustrate how the repression of the Palestinian struggle is global and very much alive and kicking in the so-called liberal democracies of the West. After successfully submitting my PhD dissertation last year, I was employed as an associate lecturer for critical undergraduate module, uh, unknowing that I'd become a victim of this precise culture. Soon after I announced my new appointment on social media, I was vilified by Zionist groups and publications who dismissed me as an anti-Semite and a daughter of a so-called convicted terrorist while being dismissive of my family and our own experiences surviving many of Israel's crimes since 1948 that are yet to be recognized and receive justice. I was immediately treated as a disposable worker, which pushed me to launch a fight back that attracted tens of thousands of supporters around the globe and succeeded to let me, ret uh, to, let me return to my teaching duties. None of this is surprising given their ideological interest to silence Palestinian voices and their allies to reinforce the hege hegemonic narrative of Israel. But it is the response of my university that should be of concern because it is an institution that is supposed to embody freedom of speech and critical thinking. Instead, uh, the university had suspended my teaching without any prior notice, pressured by its recent adoption of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism that obfuscates the former with anti-Zionism through ideologically charged examples to protect Israel from the charge of racism against the Palestinians. The definition doesn't want us to state the obvious and call Israel racist. To the Palestinians and anyone knowledgeable of Israel's systematic oppression of the Palestinians, it goes without question that Israel is inherently a racist state with settler colonial and apartheid values and practices whose brutal manifestations cannot be disguised. 
Nonetheless, the university bowed to pressure from the UK government, articulated by uh, ex-education minister who threatened regulatory action and suspension of funding streams for institutions that don't adopt this ideological state weapon by the end of 2020. Despite fierce opposition in the UK, um, uh, many universities adopted it. Um, while excluding Palestinians from discussions around its serious ramifications, but uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I, uh, it's, I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase um, for time's sake. Subsequently, I became a test case for its application, which further revealed the, the racist nature of such a definition embodied in its silencing of the Palestinian uh, experience under Israel's racist systems of settler colonialism and apartheid. Despite the university's promise not to lim limit legitimate debate and criticism of, of Israel and Palestine, its first member uh, of, of framed under the IRA definition was Palestinian. I recently became again subjected to another investigation by my university with no apparent care for my well-being after further outrageous attacks by people who don't know me and I don't know, with the aim of reinforcing sympathy for our oppressor and demonizing and silencing their victims. Israel's repression of the Palestinians is not sealed off from the rest of the world by its apartheid wall. The connections are many, and those chains of complicity have been exposed by many human rights organizations, including a Amnesty and the UN. The ideological battle that maintains Western support for Israel rests on perpetuating militarism, racism, and in particular, Islamophobia. I will conclude by pointing out the obvious. You cannot stand up to racism and be silent on Zionism and Israel's systematic oppression and domination of the Palestinians. Again, uh, that was a statement by Shahid Abu Salama, who contributed a chapter um, in uh, Light in Gaza, um, who's been under vicious attack. Uh, I was just paraphrasing one paragraph, which was on details about the UK. But other than that, it was all her statement. Um, now I'm going to introduce the, the two uh, speakers that we do have here. Um, first is Jihad Abu Salim, who's the Education and Policy Coordinator of the Palestine Activism Program at the American Friends Service Committee. He's also completing his PhD in the history and uh, Hebrew and Judaic studies at NYU, focusing on Arab and Palestinian intellectual discourse on Zionism. He's an editor and contributor to the book Light in Gaza. And next we will have Shafika Hashash, who's a community organizer, newly based in Chicago, and has worked for years on disability justice, labor organizing, and Palestine. So they'll e each speak for f 15 or so minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Go ahead. Thank Thanks, Shireen. Hi everyone. Thanks. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be back at the Socialism Conference and uh, to be in Chicago, and to join you all today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for being part of this conversation. I'm I'm really uh, excited to do this the first ever uh, talk about this book, uh, which is you know uh, which has been a very exciting project um, to, to work on with my colleagues and with uh, Palestinians in, in Gaza and around the world. And I will talk a little bit about the book, um, uh, and then I will uh, let my colleague Shafika talk about uh, uh, the, the question of organizing and, um, and how do, what do we do, where do we go from here. So um, I'm Palestinian from Gaza. I moved to the US 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, I have been, as Shireen mentioned, I've been working on my PhD. And at the same time, uh, I, uh, in 2018, I joined uh, AFSC uh, to, to be a full-time organizer uh, around issues related to Palestine. But my, my main focus uh, over the past four years has been uh, centered around Gaza and advocating uh, around Gaza and you know, trying to raise awareness uh, around the issues that uh, that concern Gaza, especially uh, you know, with with the blockade that it's been going on for more than 15 years and the uh, Israeli attacks uh, that happen every once in a while, uh, as Shahid described them, you know, mowing the lawn. So um, the this book is. Uh, a 
product of a campaign that uh, my colleagues and I at AFSC have been working on uh, called Gaza Unlocked. And Gaza Unlocked is a campaign that aims um, to, one, raise awareness around the Gaza Strip and around the Palestinian uh, experience in Gaza, and also work to shift policies within the U.S., but also beyond the United States with regards to the blockade, um, the criminalization of Palestinians in general, but also in Palestinians from Gaza, the criminalization of uh, freedom of speech, uh, and the, 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 the limiting of any discussion on Gaza because of certain repercussions that are always, uh, you know, that are the, always the elephant in the room when it, when it comes to talking about Gaza. So um, we, I started my work with AFSC uh, one day before the Great March of Return started in Gaza in 2018. And the Great March of Return was a movement of mass popular mobilization that started in the Gaza Strip uh, to uh, call for uh, ending the blockade, but also and also to shed light on the the plight of Palestinians in Gaza, uh, especially you know because of the blockade with unemployment being between 60 to 70 percent, uh, you know very difficult conditions. I'm sure all of you heard about you know heard the statistics, the numbers, how difficult life has been in Gaza for people there. Uh, but the Great March of Return, I think, will be remembered and will be talked about in history books in in the decades to come as a moment when Palestinians in Gaza decided that even though the the main concern that uh, that uh, uh, was important for them at that moment the immediate concern was the blockade the, the fact that there are two million Palestinians who are isolated from the rest of the world who uh, who are collectively punished by Israel's brutal policies who uh, who are you know suffering due to the lack of nutrition nutrition, electricity, water, and, and so on and so forth. When, they, uh, when, when a grassroots movement emerged in Gaza in 2018, uh, it, it wasn't called the Great March for Ending the Blockade. It, it was called the Great March of Return because even though the, the immediate concern was the issue of the blockade, Palestinians there understood that um, uh, the, the, the root of Gaza's uh, current, you know, crisis and, and problems has to do with the issue that with with the with the with the history that started before and in 1948 and still continues until today so that was an important moment for me um, personally and for my colleagues and for the people you know the the communities that we work with to uh, to keep the conversation uh, around Gaza alive in the United States and uh, it, it really helped us um, focus our attention on what is important to talk about, not just in terms of the you know basic awareness raising. You know, we educate the public about uh, you know how how difficult the situation is, but the fact that we need to have a clear we need to have clear politics that define our work around our work around Gaza, and uh, and and that that guide us in, in our efforts to, to keep Gaza as part of the conversation around Palestine, but also around all sorts of issues related to inequality, injustice, and discrimination against oppressed people. So we, we understood the message of Palestinians in Gaza, that there can't be a, a conversation around the Gaza Strip and the plight of Palestinians there without placing the, the Palestinian experience in Gaza within the broader framework of the struggle for justice and liberation and return in Palestine. And that's why Palestinians in Gaza named the Great March the Great March of Return. And that's why return was the main theme, the main demand of that, of that march that continued for two years. And uh, we, uh, I'm sure you all witnessed the, the brutal response on the part of the Israeli regime, um, the occupation regime against those protesters who, uh, who were you know, going every day to the, to the fence that separates the Gaza Strip from the rest of historic Palestine and, and say, we just want to go home. So um, 
we hosted uh, Ahmed Abortema, the Palestinian writer from Gaza, who, whose writings inspired the Great March of Return in 2019. Uh, he traveled uh, all over the United States um, and on a national speaking tour where he talked about the March of Return, what it represented, its, its message, and, and, and linked the current reality in Gaza to the struggle for return and for ending the blockade. And, and, and that inspired us uh, later on to think about a, to continue our efforts to highlight voices from Gaza, to shed light on, on, on the perspectives that are uh, generally dismissed. Palestinians in Gaza don't get to travel a lot. They don't get to leave the Gaza Strip. They don't get to come to the United States or to other parts of the world, and people all over the world don't get to go to Gaza and meet with people there. Um, but we, we hoped to, we wanted to um, build on the, on the efforts that we've been doing in terms of ending the blockade, if not physically, but intellectually. Um, and, uh, and realize that we, we, if Israel is capable of building uh, physical fences and, uh, and checkpoints and barriers that separate Palestinians from, from, one, from each other and separate Palestinians from the rest of the world to fragment their society, to fragment their experience, to weaken their body politic, to make them uh, vulnerable to, you know, to, uh, to uh, prevent them from organizing on a, on a national level, uh, whether in the homeland or in the diaspora. We wanted to challenge that because we, this is how I personally understand the blockade. Uh, as someone who experienced it, I was in Gaza in 2007 when the blockade uh, started and I left in 2013 during uh, a very difficult period after the coup in Egypt and, um, and, uh, and the intensifying of the, of the closure, of the, of the measures of closure around Gaza. So, Again, we, you know, we, th we wanted to continue this effort you know, of connecting Gaza to the rest of Palestine, connect connecting Palestinians in Gaza with, uh, with Palestinians from all over the world, and with activists and organizers and academics and intellectuals. And this is how this book project you know, came to being. We, uh, w uh, we thought, what can we do during COVID? You know, when it's the pandemic and you're sitting at home, and you know, we so we connected with uh, with authors, with Palestinians in Gaza, activists and, and writers and and organizers and and people who um, who are involved in in different kinds of spaces and circles and and, and organizing efforts, and we basically uh, we asked a single question, a question that defines the message of the book and its politics. And we called, you know, we asked people to submit their abstracts, to send us ideas for what they would be willing to write for this anthology. And the question that we asked was uh, the following. Can a better future for Gaza be imagined as part of a broader vision for ending the Nakba through return, restoration of rights, and achieving justice? And. This, this question is, is very important for, for us and for, for the, this book project because it creates the terms of the conversation according to what Palestinians deem uh, appropriate and, and what Palestinians deem the, the right approach and the right framework to understand their plight and to understand the, the, the solution or uh, a way forward to resolve the, the ongoing injustices that Palestinians have been suffering from for more than seven decades. So let me talk about this question a little bit. We, Palestinians in Gaza today um, live in a, in a strip of land that we call the Gaza Strip, uh, a geographic entity that emerged only after the 1948 uh, Nakba the catastrophe that befell Palestinians uh, then. And before 1948, there was no such a thing as a Gaza Strip. The, there, there used to be a Gaza district, one administrative region of uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a broader uh, mandate Palestine, a region that was contiguous, connected, linked politically, economically, institutionally, and so on and so forth. Uh, so in 1948, when the State of Israel was established, uh, Palestinians, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, around 200,000, are pushed to the southwest towards this enclave that 
that only formed as a place of refuge uh, for those hundreds of thousands of refugees that was supposed to be a, a temporary refuge for them, a place where those refugees who, were, who Israel kicked out from their towns and villages in the vicinity of, uh, of Gaza and, and surrounding areas, they, they sought you know, safety and security there and, and searched for, uh, for, for, for safety in, in a place that wasn't conquered by Zionist militias uh, in 1948. Now, those hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who were expelled from their town cities and villages ended up in what became the Gaza Strip as refugees, in addition to 100,000 Palestinians who were already within the confines of this new geographic entity. And for Palestinians in 1948, their stay in Gaza was supposed to be temporary. Uh, war wasn't, wasn't uh, foreign for, Palestini for Palestine, historically Palestine witnessed, you know, the passing of, uh, of numerous conquerors and armies and, and so on and so forth. And people historically used to relocate from one village to another, from one city to another, to, to, avoid, uh, to avoid, you know, uh, being caught in, 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 the, in the middle of, of, of fighting and, and so on and so forth. So you, so you ha so the Gaza Strip emerges in 1948 as this small area where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians are concentrated. And after the war ended and the state of Israel was established, one of the first things that Israel did was to say those Palestinians aren't allowed to go to their cities, towns, homes, villages, property. And, and they, they, were, they ended up becoming refugees, uh, according to Israel's logic, for eternity in that, in that newly emergent Gaza Strip. And that happened for, for a, a very clear and obvious reason. Israel wanted to maintain its Jewish majority population. And it did so by expelling Palestinians and by keeping them out as refugees. And this is, this is basically like the, the, the very core, the very issue at hand here. So uh, to sum up, um, we have heard about endless initiatives and ideas for how can Gaza be uh, you know a perfect place you know after with the Oslo Accords and the so-called peace process um, ideas you know under ideas for economic peace there there was talk about turning Gaza into a Singapore I don't know why but <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and and you know creating uh, job opportunities and improving the economic situation. Others talked about a Marshall Plan for Gaza. Um, but but what, what's missing from the conversation is the very political root of why there is a crisis in Gaza today, why Gaza has been in, in has been going through all these all these strategies and all this pain for more than seven decades, and it's because 70% of Palestinians in Gaza, their homes are just within walking distance across the fence that separates them from from their homes, towns, and villages. And uh, and now, as we you know, as we approach uh, uh, you know the, the year 2050, it is anticipated that the population of the Gaza Strip will double and the population density of Gaza will double. It is anticipated that, you know, Gaza is on, on the Mediterranean Sea. It's, it's, a coastal, it's a coastal strip. And with climate change, with lack of resources, with, with, the, with, with the failure of, of the global community to address all these challenges, Gaza is already a model for what privileged, rich, wealthy, powerful communities will do to marginalize and to fence off the unwanted, the undesired, and those who are not welcome in the club of the privileged. And, and that's why I think you know, th this book is not just about narratives from the ground or the permission to narrate, and this is all here, but it's also about what kind of politics we should adopt when thinking about Gaza, what kind of framing, what kind of analysis that need to inspire our work around Gaza. And, and, you know, when we've been in the shadow of a failed peace process uh, that centered the notion of the two-state solution and, and partition and dividing the land and keeping privilege, more privilege in the hands of one group at the expense of another, and it failed. And we, 
everybody at this moment, there is a general feeling of frustration and deadlock, and and if and even those involved in the mainstream, you know, like politics around this issue, um, feel frustrated. And and I and I feel this is the this is the time for for the international community, for us as organizers, to face the truth. There is one path forward, and this path can only be achieved through return, through justice, through equity, and through respect for people, and to to challenge. Uh, a vision for a, uh, a reality where a group of people lives privileged and has access to rights and resources at the expense of another just because the state uh, wants, the state that represents them wants to maintain those privileges and, uh, and, and, and keep them. So that's the message of the book and I hope you all get it, read it um, and, and enjoy it enjoy for the lack of a better word, but inspire you to inspire your action, inspire your work in organizing around Palestine. I'll stop here and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions and thank you for listening and again, thanks for being here. Alrighty, thank you so much, Jihad. For those who don't know, Jihad and I have actually been friends for uh, about 10 years now, which is scary because that means we're very old. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we've, we've seen marriages and now babies, and it's, it's wild stuff to think that it started in just kind of college organizing. Um, so yeah, so hi everyone, my name is Shafika Hashash. I am newly based in Chicago, happy to be here, meet folks. And I was asked to give my take on sort of socialist organizing for Palestine and my opinions or how I feel um, on how some of that work can be better achieved. And I have to say, I'm gonna draw a little bit of inspiration on how I talk from uh, Danny Ketch, is excellent, excellent talk on US gun violence yesterday for those who missed it. But I'm gonna situate myself a little bit um, and I'm gonna say things that I, I actually don't plan on doing, right? So um, that's totally fine. So I myself am not from Gaza. Um, I am from the West Bank. Uh, my family is one of the many, many families who went to South America first. So they were in Venezuela and then came to the US. Um, and so they are the very, very cool Palestinians who speak uh, Arabic, Spanish, and English, but then only pass down Arabic to their kids, so we're much less cool. Um, but I will say, you know, in saying that, something I was thinking about as we were hearing the excellent statement that Shadeen had read by our other uh, co-presenter who wasn't here today, is that, and I'm just gonna be really honest about this, my parents are great and all, but they're more on the like normie side of things. My parents weren't Marxist activists. Uh, my parents were folks who fled like most other people. Their parents fled, they fled, and then you know resettled in the US. And I don't say that as a thing to down on them. I say that as a thing to situate the fact that it's really amazing to uplift and talk about the incredible, incredible radicals, but to remember that millions and millions of people who take part in things at some point in their life, who don't take part in things, are you know um, still a big part, that they're actually the most massive part, whether we think about Palestine or the US. And so my parents, like a lot of others, some of their first protests that they had actually really started going to, that they dragged uh, all five, at the time five, we later became seven kids, but five kids too, were the protests during the second intifada. And it was one of the first things that really radicalized me uh, as a child, it was very cool and inspiring to attend 100,000 protests in DC. So um, with that being said, for those who also don't know, uh, I am very blind and so being Palestinian, being blind, these are things that have shaped organizing uh, effectively my entire life. When you grow up blind, you grow up organizing because you don't have textbooks and things and you need to actually learn how to uh, talk with lots of different people who are good and some who are very bad on you know, your rights and that you should also be able to get things in school, even in the US in a nice you know, New Jersey suburb and whatnot. Um, and you also learn kind of about ways that people can discard you and discard things like your education. And yeah, you really start organizing, I would say at a very young age. So um, I'm gonna kind of, I just wanted to ground myself, who I am, and then push into socialists working on solidarity organizing. So one of the first things I would say that I've learned in organizing in all facets, 
Um, and this is, I think it sounds obvious, and then you realize when we talk about it that it's not always happening, is the first lesson is to always be advancing uh, campaigns in solidarity organizing and in your organizing in general. Um, so when I say this, it isn't to knock that we shouldn't be uh, protesting or something. I want to be super clear. That is not what I said. Protests, good. You know, protests are good. Um, in our Palestine organizing back at NYU, in organizing we did outside of the university, we did all of that. We did protests. Um, we did the die-ins. We did, you know, all these things. Things that people had literally told us they came down from other parts of the country to harass us about. That actually happened in our organizing. Uh, one of the biggest things we did that had drawn national media attention was actually an eviction flyering campaign. And for those who aren't super familiar with kind of college style and college activism, it's a very good campaign where you go, you put eviction style notices in the rooms of, you know, you can reach thousands of people because of the way dorms are set up. Um, and you kind of educate on the Palestinian issue through that. Hours of like most Palestine organizing got picked up by the media and we were anti-Semitic, all of that jazz. Um, you know, things I think for the large, I believe for everyone here doesn't need to be kind of explained in great detail. So what did that do? That got us a really big influx of members. Um, every couple of years, like everyone else, we would protest because of the bombings in Gaza. What did that do? That got us a really big influx of members. And when there wasn't a sustained campaign, what did that do? The members kind of left. Um, because it's exciting and then things wane and you feel like, oh, what are we doing? What are we doing? Um, and so for me, even though those are kind of those highlight things that made the media X, Y, Z that we had worked on, the protests and the die-ins and the eviction notice campaigns, what I view as our most successful campaign effort was actually organizing our union for one and then organizing because we took part in organizing our union uh, for graduate students, graduate student workers and student workers in general was then getting the union to publicly vote, you know, the university union, not obviously the UAW overall, but to publicly vote um, in favor of BDS. And why is that more powerful, even though it really didn't quite make the media attention in the same way? Well, I think for me, that meant that we actually had to go to all of these departments, and that's literally what we did, to physics, to math, to, you know, not just love the native studies. They didn't need a lot of convincing, you know. Um, we had to go to these other departments where they may not literally know jack all about Palestine and talk to them about it, talk to them about why they should first come out to vote, because if there's not voter quorum, as everyone knows, the vote doesn't mean anything. So come out to vote, and then why they should vote yes, you know, in favor of BDS. And that's really what builds your group. Um, it gives folks not only something to do, it's not like it's busy work, but it gives you something meaningful to make sure that people are constantly holding these conversations and building more people to talk about Palestine in their departments where that is just not a fucking focal point at all. Um, you know, I'm gonna kind of mention later about not letting the enemy be the perfect of the good, but for folks who work in labor organizing and anyone who's really done campaigns overall, you kind of do this thing where you map folks out one through a five, ones are people, they're super close to you, they're on your side, fives are hostile, you know. Um, and I think that what I've found is that we can be really good at being hostile towards our fives, which like they deserve it, um, so that's fine. But what we are not as good at is pulling our threes to twos, our twos to ones. Um, and you know, what I found, and I, I, I'm gonna also do the Denny Catch thing where when I say the left, I'm not fake looking at some specific group or whatever, I just mean overall, you know, in total. It's really easy to go and publicly shame or be mad and, and have all your anger out on the people who are num numbers two and three on the scale instead of working to actually pull them in. Um, and I'm not gonna go on a tirade about how I hate Twitter for that purpose, but I really do hate Twitter for that purpose. Um, and so with all that being said, 
it's letting the perfect be the enemy of the good in the sense of working with your comrades who are number two. They still don't really fully get it. Oh, you know, they say some things that aren't right, and they're not, right? Like, I'm not gonna sit here and defend like some 67 borders comment or whatever, but it's freaking out about that instead of being like, okay, but I can actually get you to change your mind. And in union organizing and in labor organizing, something I've got the you know, privilege to spend a good bit of time doing both on the outside and also when we were uh, union stewards, is actually knowing that that's not who your enemy is. And in fact, if you can't keep shifting people from their numbers to get closer and closer, you are just gonna keep losing. Um, and that is just how it's gonna work. So in also talking about not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, and oh man, I'm just bracing myself for the discussion portion when I talk about this. Uh, we have, we you know, would be remiss in the US to not talk about Congress, right? Um, so in Congress right now, what we can say for certain is there are two, uh, my apologies, three people who do you know, explicitly support BDS work, who talk about Palestine, and that being Cori Bush, Rashida Tlaib, and Ilhan Omar. Now, like, I'm sure there are flaws in all of these people, there are flaws in everything in, in Congress, but again, like the enemy being the, the perfect, the same, whatever it is, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Something I learned actually at an excellent, excellent Palestine organizing camp, uh, led by the AFSC, if I remember correctly, was that we do a really good job in campaign work of like crapping on things when they go bad, but we actually forget to thank people and actually build support around the people who are doing things that are good. Um, and so, you know, what I'm saying in that is that we actually want to make it a positive for Congress people, for local officials, um, for whoever it is, you know, whatever project it is you're thinking about. If it's a school board and there's something going on with the library banning a book, whatever it may be, it's you want to make it a positive to be on the group of folks supporting Palestine, supporting Palestine liberation. Sometimes it's even campaigns just to talk about Palestine. Um, and when we only make it a negative, or when we forget to make it a positive, when people are doing the good things we talk about, then we actually lose a huge opportunity to make people want to keep doing that good work on Palestine more publicly, more often. And we also teach people that to do good things on Palestine means you will only ever get negative repercussions. And if they're doing bad things on Palestine, they know they're going to get crapped on anyway, so they don't really care. Um, it's not what's going to convince. Oh, I have five minutes. Okay, I'm almost done anyway. Um, and you know, when I say all this, I'm going to be real honest. I'm like not about to sit here and be like, and that's why you should go vote. I'm like pretty 50-50 about that. Um, my husband is 99.9% .9 don't vote. I mostly vote. Um, just as a quick funny aside, you know, our joke is that I am pretty Marxist. My husband is like the socialist anarchist and we are like hashtag leftist unity. And so, you know, when I say that, it is really to say, like jokes aside, it is to say that I think we spend too much time like shouting down these things instead of promoting good work instead. Instead of pounding the pavement on things that can promote positive attributions and positive um, liberation work on Palestine. Because at the end of the day, and I promised I wasn't going to say this name, but I'm just going to have to, at the end of the day, like if you go into Gaza and you're like, what's your take on the Bowman affair? No one gives a shit. Like they just don't. It's not a thing, you know? Um, and you can say you have that one friend or whatever who knows about it in Gaza. It's like, cool. That's not changing anything. Um, and I'll say, you know, Jihad and I actually had this great conversation earlier today where we were talking about there being this massive cognitive dissonance when it comes to approaching electoral politics where, you know, there's a approach, which I think is perfectly fine, of we have to be militant, radical, not engaged, whatever, you know, more like my husband's camp. And I feel that that's totally fine. That's like, that's an opinion people hold, right? But then there's three, four, five times as much time critiquing the elected work going on. And I guess my point is, don't spend an enormous time of energy doing that and instead build something. Like, 
um, like that really is just such a key takeaway is that people get, my parents, Palestinians, would never join if they saw the main goal was to just keep like crapping on things, but they go to things when they feel that it's building. They'll do, you know, petitions or talk or go to political education things. Um, they're, you know, very, very, very huge in their Palestinian and American communities. And so those things are very important. And I think my last point, and this is kind of what's gonna connect us to, to the book, um, is that narrative work is important. I'm gonna steal Danny Ketch's line. It was such a good talk, you guys, yesterday. It was an excellent talk. It was that narrative is more important, but narrative doesn't change if we, narrative is more important than laws, but narrative doesn't change if we don't change laws. Um, and so you can't just discard the two. They really go hand in hand. So I'm gonna hit on Jihad's point around the March of Return in 2018 and 2019, where Palestinians in Gaza did the thing that people love, right? They protested forever and ever. And it was so beautiful and so awesome. And it was the first time that you could actually talk about Gaza and you weren't talking about the, you know, just bombs being dropped and you weren't talking about Hamas. And instead you had this other incredible liberation work to be talking about. And it was just such a blip on the radar here. And it was so sad. And it was something that I actually, you know, would say is kind of a collective failure on the left in the sense that we actually then need to be working with some, you know, some institutions, for lack of a better word, to make sure that these things get known and are put out there much broader. And I think that's why this book in particular um, is so special. It's, you know, been written about in the New York Times and crap on the New York Times as you may. It is huge that millions and millions of people are being told like, oh, here's this book about liberation, about return in Gaza, being written by people in Gaza. Um, I had one more example, but for time's sake, I'm gonna stop here and thank you so much, everyone, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay, uh, thank you, Jihad and Tafika. Um, now we'll take, we'll have a discussion period so if you could raise your hand, I'll call on you, then we'll take about three people at a time that'll come to the mic. Um, so I'll start with the fellow raising their hand with the colorful shirt. Yeah, yeah, and, and you can feel free to come to the green, uh, yeah. All right, John, you can feel free to come up too. And um, if you can keep your comment to three, minute, uh, three minutes, I'll, I'll time it. I'll let you know when you have 30 seconds. Yeah, thank you for, for the speech and everything. Um, I was curious, like, m one of my questions was like, uh, I recently read this memoir on, I'm also Sean from Brooklyn. Um, uh, I'm also Iranian from Middle East, so West Asia. And I was reading a memoir about uh, the communist struggle and prior to the Iranian Revolution. And one thing that came across that was very interesting, and I pretty much saw it for the first time, was the um, how uh, the, throughout the whole West Asia, North Africa, um, the all like all the, the revolution parties were very interconnected. Like they were. Um, this was about pretty much the Mujahideen camp, which they had, they had like, oh, and also the Fadoyim, like, you know, all those communists, like, the Russian communists, um, they had um, camps all over Jordan, Egypt, that they were trained in, and obviously it was also post-Algerian war and independence of it, and it was, the 60s was basically a year that that type of struggle was the very, you know, Cuba happened, the struggle in China, and you saw that, like, revolutionary, uh, and also, the, obviously, the Palestinian PLO um, was a thing. And then that really, but really, like, the people stayed in those camps for 10 years, throughout the, like, 60s and 70s. And when they came, came back to Iran, they actually were one of the reasons why they were able to do the revolution there, because they've been tra training in camps there. I just wanted to know, I know the time has changed, but why is that now 
we're so like reserved with this revolutionary conversation. And, like, it, and then I know that there's we're, we're shifted to struggle and fight it in a different way now with Palestine. Um, but in the void of that revolutionary movement, and especially with the communists and socialists, uh, uh, there is going to be more reactionary that would fill the militant and contra void. And I just wanted to know, I mean, just thinking out loud, what would be, like, what do you think about this? And, you know, what do you, do you even see a future in that? Because you, I think you would need that to have liberated Palestine in some ways. You need the cadre of militants uh, organization somehow. And it has to be the whole Middle East behind it. It can't just be, you know, just a few countries. Or 30 seconds. Country. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Mal uh, from Chicago. I'm with DSA. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you both for being here. This has been wonderful. I wanted to say I really appreciated the comments that were made specifically about you know spending more energy focusing on the good rather than constantly like calling out you know the more negatives because um, I do think that's something that socialists and left people on the left as a whole have a tendency to do to kind of be a little more pessimistic and. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time talking on like specific actions of specific electives because I do think Palestinian solidarity and liberation is so much deeper than that. Um, I mean, as we all know, but in the case of Bowman specifically, um, I guess my question around that would be with Bowman, um, and I know being a member of DSA, this was a uh, person who was elected with the labor and um, donations from an organization that holds a line um, to be in solidarity with Palestine. So when that labor and those donations are taken and then it directly contradicts you know, our commitment to Palestine, what does accountability look like then? Because I, you know, in the grand scheme of things, Bowman is one very small fraction of a bigger question, but on the same hand, I do think it has broader implications as a whole on how we as members of an organization that um, endorse someone you know, how are we holding them accountable and how are we making sure our elected don't just take that advantage of that labor and that time and, and, and those, you know, funds to then just break our lines. Um, because I think we, you know, what we're realizing is not enough bold action being taken in electoralism. And I think that's one of the things that holds us back. And I also want to make sure that the commitments that I make as an organizer are going to someone who's going to represent my interests um, so yeah, that's my question. Like, what does accountability look like in that context without possibly just focusing on the negative? Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so I have after John, person in the blue jacket. Sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, and then Rabab. And and feel free to bring up any questions you have about Gaza, about organizing in the U.S., uh, about Palestine. Uh, it doesn't have to mm -hmm. stick to one uh, issue. But yeah. I really appreciate your comment about not letting the, the desire for perfection destroy the good. And in that context, I'd like to respond to the discussion about Congressman Bowman. Can I, um, I'm just gonna say something really quick. If this could be like the last Bowman comment, okay. and then okay. we go this, like in Teresa much more. The only reason I mention it is it's come up a couple of times. Yeah. Okay. Bowman is not like Manchin in the Senate. His one vote for the Iron Dome did not make or break that, like Manchin's vote in the Senate. But he had a new district that had been re redrawn, and he has to win. In order to have any influence, you have to be at the table. And, but that's as far as I'm going to go. I think it's important that we recognize People are in a different. People are in different stages of understanding, and to re recognize that, there was a discussion yesterday about two two <clears throat> two things that are current. One is the is the story of the um, uh, project Nimbus and the opposition that has developed about that. Right? Do people know what Nimbus is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. There is a fairly large group started by, um, what do they call themselves here? 
Jewish diaspora in tech. So yesterday there was a comment about this, and there was no recognition that there are a large number of Jewish workers in Google, in Google, at Google who are part of this um, opposition. And to not recognize that is a mistake. And um, another example is in Israel now, there's a draft resistance movement that's been going on for years called Nesset Road. And nobody acknowledges it. In fact, I had one person say to me, well, they should just do that. I mean, you're standing up against these kids. They're 18, 19 years old. They're standing up against the programming that they received their entire lives. They're demonized. They're called traitors. They're called self-hating Jews. You know, the, the list is- 30 seconds. So we need to recognize them and support them. And I guess that's all I have to say. Um, did you? I had you for first. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. My name is Sarah. I live in New Mexico. I've been doing Palestine solidarity organizing since the late 1990s. And I wanted to um, ask a couple questions about Gaza and the sort of horizons. Because what was so inspiring to me about the unity uprising of 2021 was like, the changing of the horizons, right? And so I wanted to ask you had and um, any of the speakers and any of the people here, like, what role do you think it played in um, the 2018 March of Return that it was specifically called Return, mm -hmm. right? And sort of making possible a broader unity across all the different ways in which Palestinian people are oppressed, whether it's in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, 48, inside Israel, um, in the diaspora, right? Like, so did, did the uh, March of Return help to bring together this broader, un like the, the reimagining of horizons, right? And that's my first question. And the second question, and this is kind of specific to Gaza because of its proximity to Egypt is, and this came up in Muhammad's session yesterday, is the, you know, I had been hoped obviously that the Egyptian revolution of 2011 would, you know, sort of free people in Gaza from this prison that they were in, right? And that didn't end up happening. And so where are we at now in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, the possibilities for pan-Arab revolutionary change? This kind of unity that we saw inside Palestine, is that mm -hmm. is that changing the possibilities across the Arab world? Um, so if, if the speakers have any comments on that, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we'll take, uh, Great question, by the way. We'll take Rabab and then Sandra and then uh, Abel, Abel. I'm sorry, I forget how to say your name. <laughs> and then we'll go back to the speakers and then have another set of questions. But go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you for the speech. Uh, it was very informative. Um, so I have a question about organizing, labor organizing in particular. So you mentioned the system of one to five. And uh, we also mentioned a little bit about working with someone, for example. And although I will not choose that path, or like I definitely understand and respect that path. So my question is for whoever choose that path, how would you maintain yourself, maintain your value while you're trying to work with people who are on two, three, maybe four, trying to get them to one? Um, in the sense that there's, they're working within the system, their existence, and their value that brings their effectiveness is within the system while the system exists. And I'm, Hoping and thinking that your effort is to eventually change the system, build a new one. <laughs> so I don't like I see a lot of contradiction in trying to work within the system to change the system. Um, so it's like I definitely understand the system, but I would just like you to shed some light into it. Thank you. Um, Sandra, do you want to go next? And and feel free to. I'm sorry, I didn't say all this at the beginning. Feel free to introduce yourself, say your name, and where you're coming from. Jihad and Shafika. Um, I'm Sandra Tanad, I'm a Palestinian. Um, and I've been working with Jihad on Gaza campaigning, um, and it's been such a pleasure um, to just know him and his passion and his drive and always bringing us back to the roots. Um, yesterday I attended a workshop by Ashley Woodard Henderson of the Highlander Center. One of the things that she said, and you know, I'm gonna put it out there, she, she knew it was challenging, 
is that socialists, you know, tend to be to treat, you know, uh, Palestinians and other uh, marginalized people as like the girlfriend they never asked out, um, meaning that they don't really get to know you. <laughs> They don't even know your name sometimes. They don't know what your dreams are, your passions are. Um, but they're telling the world that they love you. They're telling you know the whole world, this is my boo. <laughs> and then you know, it really it it strikes me like you know here we are. We have two Palestinians, and, and I just want to ask you, like, what do you want? <laughs> what are you asking the left? What are you asking the socialist um, at this conference and, and broadly to do for Gaza? Um, my name is Devel. I'm also a member of PSA. And, um, my question is also about Belgian no, <laughs> 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 um, my, my question is about uh, pan Arabism, and um, Muhammad was, here, was talking about that yesterday as well. And, um, and so I wanted to ask, like, um, how pan Arabism, uh, you know, relates to specifically the struggle for uh, um, um, liberation of Gaza specifically. Um, and, and, and also kind of related to that, Rabab was uh, part of a, a wonderful panel uh, um, on the first day about Sudan. And the panel co-panelist uh, uh, yeah. mentioned um, specifically how Arabic, the language itself, has some um, revolutionary potential in that, you know, the struggle in Tunis is heard in Sudan and, and all those kinds of things. So I want to ask, in, in, in this march for return, was there, I know there was, you know, a dearth of coverage in, in the Western world in, in English, but what was it like in Arabic and was there a difference in that? Um, so, yeah. Sorry, sort of related question, but mm. thanks. Thanks. Thank so, uh, Jihad and Chapika, if you want to respond to those, and then we'll take another round afterwards. You can go first, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, okay, great. And I just want to be clear, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, like, totally be a bitch about the Bowman stuff, but I'm just saying that I don't want it to be like just all that gets talked about, because I think that's really boring. Um, so, um, sorry, I just took some notes while folks were speaking. Okay, so, this revolutionary conversation. Okay, so one of the questions, I kind of want to hit on in a slightly different perspective, and I think Jihad will have a great answer in a also different perspective, was a question around, um, you know, why the revolutionary conversation? Like, why why do we shy away from it? So I actually think Jihad will do a better job answering in terms of, um, like, in the Middle East, you know, I, I really can't sit here and pretend like I feel like I feel confident answering, is there a pan-Arab movement coming soon? I don't think so, but, you know. Um, but in terms of, I think, another angle of that conversation is like revolutionary work in the US. And I kind of wanted to hit on this uh, earlier, but couldn't tie it in super well. I think sometimes what I notice is there tends to be like a real romanticization of um, like scary revolutionary work that is amazing, like super amazing. You know, we think of, of course, Palestine and Chile and, and um, the George Floyd protests, you know, a couple years ago. Um, and then obviously, you know, even more revolutionary, revolutionary, like, you know, people I think typically when they say that mean taking up of arms and whatnot. But I also want to kind of put it in the context of um, knowing that it's okay to not to tell people like, um, how do I want to phrase this? I think it's really important to also like kind of make sure that there is an understanding of why folks, um, especially in the US in particular, well, really everywhere, don't want to participate in revolutionary work or why they're not seeing it as the path forward right now when they're feeling um, powerless. And I think it's, it's we often don't acknowledge the real fears of like, it's okay to be like, I'm afraid to die. Like, I'm not sure if I'm ready. Like, not so sure if I want my baby to die. He just was born seven months ago. Not a big fan of that prospect, you know? 
Um, and I think, you know, it gets easy to just be like, oh, revolution now, especially when we're not actually going to be the ones revolting. Um, and when we maybe won't have never actually had the life experience of like hearing bombs and hearing things. You know, the last time I was in Palestine, uh, I was in Gaza, but you could actually still hear the bombs and you could still hear these things and we were still under lockdown. And I was, you know, I have the privilege of American citizenship and they did this whole thing of, oh, all the Americans, you should start leaving. And I was like, no, that feels really shitty. Like my cousins are here, I'm here with my family. and. You know, when your parents call you like crying, asking for you to leave, and you're like, no, I'm not gonna do that. But then to just be like, why not revolution? I'm like, well, revolution is like also scary for people, right? And that maybe sounds obvious, but to even just say like, why not revolution now? It's like, well, maybe that like, like ready to really just throw it all, like isn't always there for everyone um, in that context. And people are trying different strategies too. Um, and then there are always like, I mean, fucking books on books on books on what every you know political context finally led to revolution and, and whatnot. So it's just kind of something I really wanted to make sure I said. Um, and then around the Bowman question or whatever, it, it, big the more I think interesting question of accountability. Like that's that's my what I find to be actually a really interesting question um, is that you know from my understanding. It's that like people can get endorsed and the resources you give them get taken away. And you know, for me, at this moment, that is the only leverage we have over elected is unendorsing. And if they received resources to take them away. But I think oftentimes, and I think we're getting a little better at this, at not just endorsing people like blanketly and only endorsing people that we actually can have leverage over. And I do think it's a mistake to just always like blanket endorse people or whatever, because you then don't get to pull that leverage away. Um, and I think it's important to make sure you have leverage, you have power, but like barring unendorsing, barring, you know, um, pulling the resources, whether that's like, I mean, in, in some campaigns in Chicago in particular, I mean, it's literally their whole door knocking effort. It's half of their fundraising X, Y, Z. So barring being able to pull all these things, um, there's not a whole lot you can do, right? Like we can't like, this is a joke, like big government, haha, like we can't execute them, right? Like, and that's not what I think we should be going for. And so accountability only looks as good as the amount of campaign work that actually went into it in the first place. Someone you did nothing for, you can't hold accountable. Like, it's almost impossible unless it's like a national mass movement, you know, we're talking in that context. But if you did nothing for like an elected or for some like campaign thing to happen, very rarely can you hold them accountable for something you didn't give them anything to do, so you have nothing to offer taking away. Um, and then the other good question, really good question, I appreciate it a lot, is how do you maintain your values when you're taking people who are like on the scale of a three or a two, um, you know, not the fives. Like the fives tend to mean actively hostile, like you're not working with them. But how do you maintain your values when working with the threes and the twos? And for me, I think we have to remember that when we talk about this, like I'm not actually talking about big powerful people when I'm talking about the threes and the twos. I'm talking about when you're building your movement and you're talking to your neighbor and your coworker and your, you know, dude down the block who is a three or a two, like that person isn't actually your enemy. And your goal should actually be to keep pulling them closer and not the goal of only finding your other ones. Um, because those aren't the enemy. That's not who's holding us down and who's holding the power over our head. It's not the other guy working at Amazon in our warehouse or the other guy who's a teacher who's like mediocre views on Palestine. Like at the end of the day, he isn't really doing shit. Like he doesn't hold that much power. And what you can do is gain a ton of collective power by making more of these people ones and then actually getting a campaign like your school, your university, your whatever to do BDS work. Um, I think I'll stop there for now, and I'll let you head take it over. Thank you, Shafiq. Uh, so to answer <clears throat> some of the questions, I'll start with the... Go closer to the mic, Jay. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'll start with the, the question from Sean about um, whether leftist politics in, in the Palestinian context um, 
can can become you know the the main kind of uh, guiding politics for people there. Uh, it's really hard to like it's difficult to answer this question and to to answer the question of how can the left become you know how how can we if we ever will witness a revival of the left in Palestine of communist and socialist movements. Uh, now we know that the Palestinian leftist movements, um, uh, you know, they, they don't have the same uh, scale of influence uh, within the Palestinian body politic as the, like they used to do back in the 60s, 70s. Um, and, and we can have like entire, you know, conversations, hours and hours to explain the historical context and why the, these shifts happened. But I think what's important to highlight here is that there are um, there are constants in the Palestinian struggle for liberation or for freedom, and and those constants have to do with how an oppressed people respond to a settler colonial project that is working on erasing them from their land and removing them, and deny them self determination and liberation, and for. The, you know, s since the Palestinian struggle started, this this struggle took on different manifestations and the different movements with different ideologies, worldviews, analyses uh, managed to become hegemonic, managed to lose their power, managed to become hegemonic again within the Palestinian context. Uh, and and I think this is what matters. Palestinians, regardless of their of what ideologies they adopt, what frameworks they embrace, what analyses, how they understand, how, how they, what their view, world views are, the constants is that, you know, are, are that there are people who are oppressed, who are fighting, and who are, uh, you know, employing all sorts of strategies to advance their struggle and to, to face their enemy. And that involves armed struggle, unarmed struggle, civil disobedience, uh, boycott, you know, uh, work on academic, cultural, intellectual, artistic levels, and so on and so forth. And, and I'm talking about this as, as, I'm talking about all these strategies, all these tactics, as strategies and tactics that Palestinians embrace, whether in the homeland or in the diaspora. And uh, will the left ever become hegemonic again in the Palestinian context? Um, I don't know, but all I know now is that yeah, I mean, the Palestinian body politic in, in the homeland has been divided mainly between uh, Fatah secular, you know, like pro-Abbas uh, camp and the uh, Hamas uh, IJ Islamist camp, and the left is there, you know, in, in the middle, and on the margins. Um, but, but, you know, there are, these are people with real problems, with real challenges, who are trying to figure out how to, how to, you know, push forward. And, and I think, I think for us to support, our support and our, um, uh, the, the way we relate to Palestinians and their struggle shouldn't be, and I'm not saying that you said that, but I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, saying that shouldn't be conditional on what kind of worldviews or ideologies or, uh, or approaches they embrace uh, to 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 you know advance their struggle, um, and and I and I will link your question also to the two other questions about um, the region, right? Like looking at the broader context, transnational on a transnational level. Yes, the Arab Spring was an opportunity for progressives, for leftists in the region to. Uh, to reclaim a lot of the spaces that they have been denied by Israel and Palestine and by uh, the, the, the brutal Arab regimes. Uh, the Arab Spring ended up with a setback. And, uh, you know, we've seen how this decade had has un uh, unfolded and the kind of challenges that faced all the different movements that tried to organize uh, uh, in the context of the Arab uprisings. Now, um, is there going to be another wave sometime soon? I'm sure there will be. When, I don't know. But 
we know now that uh, the, the, the questions that were at the root of why there were Arab uprisings to begin with haven't been resolved. In fact, they have been like the, 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 the problems have been intensified. Uh, the regimes became more brutal, more violent, the spaces for expression for even, uh, you know, like uh, uh, state sanctioned criticism of the regimes that was allowed before the Arab uprisings, even those spaces have been diminished. And, um, and another component of this new era of, uh, of uh, counter-revolution and, and violence in the region involves a much more direct involvement by Israel as part of the Abraham Accords, as part of the, you know, like growing alliance uh, on a regional level between Israel and the Arab regimes and the collaboration on surveillance, on militarism, on policing, and, and so on and so forth. So when another wave starts, the Palestine will be at the center of that wave because Israel uh, understands that on a, on a global scale, it's losing the, the, its arguments, it's losing its, 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 uh, its position. So uh, Israel, in, in response to, you know, like seeing, I, know, I understand all the criticisms of the Bowmans and the Tlaibs and the Omars and, you know, I understand. But for Israel to see the, that America that it took for granted for decades is shifting, they, they're responding to that by creating alliances on a regional level in the local context of the region. And the people in the region know that, they see it. Um, we're, we're witnessing the, the nascent, uh, growing, small movements that are opposing this wave of normalization and, and this alliance between Israel and the Arab regimes um, that is rooted in supporting Palestine and rejecting normalization. So yes, the, question, the answer to your question about whether, yes, there will be a movement sometime soon, I don't know when, but it, it, is, it is brewing in, in, the, in the background. And you know, those regimes took the Arab, Arab nations, Arab people for granted for decades, and then they were, they were taken by surprise during the Arab Spring. And now they're dealing with more arrogance and brutality and, and entitlement. And we, we all know how this ends usually. Um, on, the question, on the question of, and, and I hope this also answers the, the question on pan-Arabism, right? Um, I don't know to what extent pan-Arabism is going to be the defining force behind uh, uh, the, 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 the resentment that is growing against the Arab regimes and, and Israel in the region. I don't know, but uh, all I know is that uh, th there is a growing generation, there's a new generation of, 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 peop of young people who haven't even, who weren't even old enough to remember the, the early years of the Arab uprisings. And for them now, uh, they're at odds with these states that are uh, proudly in, in, in engaging in, in this alliance, in this growing alliance that involves repression, policing, surveillance, you know, uh, uh, and crackdown on dissent. So, uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, we, we see that all the attempts to remove Palestine from the general, con from the general consciousness in the region, from, to remove Palestine from curriculums, from uh, from, uh, from you know, the, the conversations even on the mainstream media. Uh, back in the day, Arab regimes used to even pay lip service to Palestine. They're not doing a lot of this anymore. Uh, they're trying to create, like, to, to, to focus on creating hyper, uh, hyper local national identities and, and, and deploy the, the discourse of we're done with the surrounding, we don't care about anyone else, we only care about issue, our issues under the big slogan of stability. Stability is the main, you know, because they, they're trying to teach people, make people see that you saw what happened, you saw, you saw what the consequences were for movements that demanded justice, equality, and, and, uh, and rights. Uh, the, you know, there, there, was, there was instability and, and, and violence, and, you know, you have to shut up and, and just, you know, mind your business and, and just uh, pray for the, for the, for the president and, and don't think about doing this again. But like I said, the, the sources of resentment, the sources of discontent are there, and this will, this will uh, backlash against this regime sometime soon. Um, what do Palestinians want? And, and I think, so what do Palestinians want? Pal different Palestinians want different things, but I think the common thread is that they want dignity. And I think the dignity is what's at stake here. Uh, we are people who have been denied 
dignity uh, for for almost a century uh, because uh, Europe decided that it, it wants to atone for its sins in, in, in our part of the world, in Palestine, and have Palestinians pay the price of European racism, anti-Semitism, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and crimes against the Jewish people. And we're paying the price of Israel wanting to maintain itself as a, as a Jewish majority ethnostate. Now, what happens as a result of all of these things is that we're deprived of dignity. At every checkpoint, at every, at every airport, at every crossing, whenever we go, we're always reminded that we, we do not exist. People give us dirty looks when they see our documents. We're, we're, uh, we're deprived of our basic human rights. My family is in Gaza, you know, my sister is now She's going to be 22 in November, and you know she was. She she's seen more than five military aggressions, like in in her in in, in the just in the past decade, which is the second decade of her life. So like, the this this needs to end, and it's an ex, it's a it's a nasty, disgusting, violent, brutal experiment, founded on racist assumptions, based on on the assumption that. A group of people can basically be pushed to the margins, can be ignored, can be can be thought of as subhuman species who don't matter, their rights don't matter. Throw bones at them every once in a while. This has to end. And if it doesn't end, this model will be replicated in, in the in the 21st century in other parts of the world. I really uh, urge everyone to read Sarah Roy's most recent article. I forgot the title, but it, but Sarah Roy talks about how Gaza is is becoming a model for oppressive regimes around the world um, where you know you you don't want to share resources you want to like exclude an entire group of people so here are the you know legal they they, they create like the legal justifications terrorists uh, savages you know they create the cultural justifications they create the pretext and on that basis they fence them off they cut them off they give them four hours of electricity a day maybe maybe drinkable water maybe they let them to travel to get medical treatment but hey let you know like cancer patients die while they will wait for permits this is wrong this is fundamentally wrong and i think we sh none of us should be sleeping at night while this happens this experiment needs to end and we have to reclaim our dignity we just need our dignity back and that's what i want personally and i think every palestinian shares that <laughs> Thank you, Jihad. That, that was, was really a long powerful. grant. <laughs> I, I, that was excellent. We were going to do a second round. I was thinking we would do a second round, but we're actually just about out of time. But it's but, lunchtime, so you guys can be nice and talk at lunch. <laughs> yeah, or feel free to uh, come up and ask uh, questions. Um, so again, the book Light in Gaza, you, you can find a copy in the book room. There's contributions from 12 uh, different uh, contributors uh, in based in Gaza, uh, touching on a variety of approaches, including, uh, as, I, as we mentioned at the beginning, Shahid Abu Salama, who talks about the idea of permanent temporality, uh, as well as her family story. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you everyone for coming and um, continue the discussions on Gaza. Thank you, Shireen. Yes, thank you, Shireen, and thank you, Jihad, and everyone for being here. Um, Sarah Roy's article is called The New Politics of Exclusion, Gaza as Prologue. Highly recommend it. Good job. Yeah. I like to talk about this, like how you started to talk yes, about yes, like, yes. Discipline, any sort of representative discipline in the you know, in the USA. Yeah. And I think that's like, you know, like the way the way I Thank see it. I, I want to come on the mic, but I also didn't want to like invoke a bunch of like you know, controversial stuff, whatever. Sure. <laughs> um, is that right. basically, you know, it's like the same thing as being represented by the party.